Welcome to Foothills Art Center and our live tour of the member show. Do we have anyone watching or people? Do we don't know? Is there a way? If, there's no way of seeing if people are currently with us. Um, let's see. I. I just want to know if I'm talking to myself alone or not. Hassan's watching. Hassan's watching. Okay, well that's all we need, right? <laughs> so. Here we are, 2020 Foothills Art Center member show. This is like our first show of the year. Uh, it's open call, super diverse. There's no media or scale restriction. It makes it very, very interesting every year to come and see what the folks in our community are doing. I think the number one thing that I hear about the show all the time and why it's worth checking out is that they just cannot believe how much talent is in our like little sphere, our sphere of people that that are just within, usually they live within a stone's throw. Almost very few pieces in this show get shipped in. Almost everything gets hand delivered. And, and a lot of these people I know and I've been seeing grow as artists as time has progressed. So every year we do the show with Jury, we have kind of like a theme that develops as we look at the work that gets submitted. So this year, we started to think a lot about the choices that go into the creation of artwork and how the final product is kind of a summation of these choices. And then how that kind of correlates to freedom and the idea of being completely free. And so one of the things that, that draw people to art making is this idea of, of freedom and the freedom to make any choice you would like. And, and, and then when you go to show the work, you essentially hold yourself responsible for all of the choices that you've made. And then we all get to come and look at it and see the summation of all those choices. And you, you almost have to stand there as the exhibitor of your own artwork. And this is what makes it so brave is to say like, yes, I stand by these choices. I think that these were the ones that were worth making, or maybe, you know, some of them weren't. And then I had to kind of double back and, and fix things midway. But this is what, this is how it all turned out in the end. And that's, I think that that ties in really nicely with the idea of freedom because I think freedom always comes with a certain amount of responsibility and what better way to hold yourself responsible as an artist than to bring your work to a wall and, and get it shown amongst, amongst your peers, amongst other talented people in your community and, and amongst just the, the general patrons of the art world, the, the people that, that maybe they don't create artwork too much themselves but they do come to the art center and they see work regularly. So these are the people that are gonna be looking and seeing what it is that you created it, and you're kind of holding yourself responsible in that way. So I think that was, that was the overall theme of the show this year, and, and in that, we asked the artists who participated to write up a little statement that was highlighting either like a challenging or an interesting choice that they made over the course of the creation of their artwork, and that's what I'd like to kind of visit today. We're gonna to go into the show, we're gonna stop at five different pieces and take a look at what they wrote about and look at their work and see how the specific choice that they're talking about affected the overall creation of the piece. So we're gonna start over here in this room. So Hassan asks, what surprises you about the growth of this exhibition? What surprises me? Okay, so just in terms of, of the, the, the sheer growth of this show that's been, that's been really incredible is like, it's that, that uh, Field of Dreams thing that you build it and they will come, right? We started off the member show when I started here installing artwork in the other building in a smaller room where we get like maybe a hundred entries in a lot smaller work and we would we, we would struggle to pick like 25 pieces that that we felt like they were ready to go up on the wall in the gallery in, in our space and now we bring it over to this building bigger walls a lot more space more of a formal kind of gallery where in the other building there's carpet and it's a little bit more domestic feeling a little more home feeling so we did that and then instantaneously in like offering up a more prestigious sort of space, the work came and the work came and filled in. And then every year, the level of quality in a lot of cases from the same artists, because you know, you've got people in the community who are entering year over year and their work is improving. They're taking chances and they're getting better. And, and the speed at which that has occurred, we're talking about inside of five years, that has really, really been surprising. So, we're going to start here with Kathy Fisher's piece, who's a digital painter, um, 
and I, I think this is just an interesting piece to highlight. She's another person who's been in the show uh, at least two or three years in a row of Memory Serves. And I wanted to talk about the choice that she highlights here is how she chose a bright, abstract image with some pinks to be this kind of background to which she then digitally paints over the top. This entire piece is rendered inside of a computer, but if you, when you look at it carefully, you can see how a lot of it has kind of a freehand gestural approach to it. And then there are some things deeper kind of buried in the background that are digital imagery and textures. Um, so she starts with that choice and then from it develops color pal the color palette and um, and other the other the other decisions that are going to be made about the aesthetic of the work this original choice sets the tone for all of that so this is one example of how these choices can, can then kind of get you in track on a track to to decide what the work is going to be going forward um, one thing I think that's really interesting to point out about this piece that is something I've seen in other kind of digital works, and I think that's something that's really natural to occur when you're working digitally painting. It's extremely easy to create 100% homogeneous sections of color. We've got, because if you were working with paint, you have a physical pigment that you're dealing with that isn't always going to go on the paper or the canvas perfectly even. However, when you're working digitally, the computer handles all of that for you, so you can create spaces that are 100% identical in their tone and their hue from across the space. And everywhere we see color blocking here, you can really, really see that. And I think that when you do digital painting, it makes it very easy to create flat, clean, and kind of sterile, not, I don't want to, I don't want to say sterile in like a bad way, but, but very clean sorts of imagery. And I think what Kathy does here is she avoids getting tied into that too much and creating like a very, very flat, very graphic looking piece by using these reoccurring textures and patterns that give the work overall some grit. She does it with these thin lines, these reoccurring lines, this most, these little uh, crescent shapes in here, almost like scales. She uses that really effectively. There's a, another little bit here. I'm not sure how this is created, but it almost looks like in real life, if you were to be like subtracting paint from the page with a tissue paper or something, but she's got that effect going here. And, and again, this is all digitally painted. So I think that's something really worth noting that makes this piece extra interesting. She avoids one of those easy to fall into like kind of pits of digitally painting, just as a nature, you know, it's built into the nature of using those sorts of tools. So that's our first piece. Is there anybody who has questions about that or? Okay, cool. So we can move on. From there, a note as to what the next piece was going to be. I think we're just going right here to this the little girl and the cow, the calf. <coughs> Renee Peterson, who is an excellent uh, portrait artist, who uh, we've seen her work many years in this show. She's always a fan favorite. She does these great, a lot of times she does these kind of pastoral scenes and they'll be on the farm or... Um, but I, I really, really like this piece. I think it's got a lot of, it's kind of candid. It feels almost like a photograph, like something was happening and we just grabbed this little snapshot of life. And I think the, the challenge and the choice that she talks about for her, for her statement was particularly interesting, interesting and worth highlighting. She talked about a choice that she actually didn't take, like a, a, a path not traveled. And it all has to do with this large block of color that makes up this calf's neck. And she really, really struggled with what it does to your eye and what it does to the overall composition of the work. How it kind of sucks you in like this black hole in the bottom left corner of the image. And she really, really struggled with it. 
and felt like it was drawing away from the background. It was making, it was kind of feeling flat. It was feeling like it was getting an undue amount of attention from the viewer's eye. And the choice that she references in her statement is that she had thought about cropping the image down or really just like cutting away maybe this corner or maybe the left side of the work to try and minimize the amount of this block that was causing her so much heartache. And eventually she ends up abandoning that idea and sticking to her guns and framing the work as is because she felt like that the, the juxtaposition of this darkness and kind of the bright light color of the girl's shirt in her hair was a really interesting juxtaposition and kept the focus of the art of the, of the viewer's eye where she wanted it. So I thought that that was a really interesting choice that she made that she kind of stuck to her guns and she stuck to the original design of the composition of the work um, in spite of what she felt like was going to be this big problem. But I, I think it all worked out in the end. I don't think it draws too much attention at all. But you can tell there's like some brush work in here. Like she might have been struggling with this area. She tries to lighten it up and get a little bit of, of shine on the calves fur so that it's not too much of this like sinkhole. And I, I think, I think she did a really good job with it. And I think it was, it's interesting that she, she mentions a choice that she kind of didn't make um, and how that would have changed the work. I think it, it would have been, it would have been sad to see more of this cut off only because I worry you would have lost what all of this is. Like if we zoom in too tightly here, then you might lose track that, that this is a calf and that this is an important subject in the, in the work. So I'm, I'm glad she, she did what she did, made the decision that she made. So if anybody has any questions about that piece or not, we, uh, I think we can move on. Where are we gonna go next? Oh, come on over here. Come over to Charlotte's piece. This is another interesting one. Charlotte's another artist we see, we've seen a couple of times in our member show who has a identifiable motif, not necessarily a style, because she works in different media, but the world map theme is something that we see from her all the time. And this year, the decision that she made was to really try and get outside of her comfort zone. And I highlight her all the time when I'm talking about this show because I think her, among other artists, really made an effort this year to experiment and to try something new and to do something that really kind of freaked her out and made her feel uncomfortable. And I know that she was surprised when we chose this work because she felt like it wasn't as strong as some of her stuff in the past. Like maybe it didn't feel as, as bundled up because um, she has a... She has a, a career in history and graphic design, so she's used to things being very tight and very clean, and I think she really got outside of her, of her comfort zone this year, and I think that that was a really amazing choice to see that happen and to see how successful she was in doing it. And I think that this, this piece is, is really, really interesting to see her use of figure developments, of these illustrative lines, and how they tie in to the coastlines of the world map and how they tie into the figures, I think all makes for a really, really interesting journey for your eye to go on. Um, and overall, just a really, a really, really tremendous piece. And I just love seeing the evolution of her work and how this world map motif is starting to become secondary. And I think as, the t as time goes on, I think we may see it become more and more just a referential, treatment to the world map motif and I think she's going to become less and less dependent on it and and more and more into her own as an artist and, and progressing and, and moving forward um, I think this is just a this is going to become a great snapshot if you were to look at Charlotte's work over say like a 10 year period you're going to look at this piece and see this is like a great turning point for her where she made the choice not just like a choice that we make over the creation of a single piece of artwork, but this is the choice that she's gonna make over the course of her career to start going down a different road and really start taking more chances with her work. Um, so I, I look forward very much to in the future to maybe putting together some kind of show or some kind of retrospective for Charlotte to see it all happen as, as, it, as it progressed over the course of the years, you know, especially two years from now, three years down the road to see where she's at and where this is all progressed to. So that's all very, very exciting to see. 
And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to highlight this work. So Charlotte's actually watching. And hey! she, <laughs> she just says, you get it. Thank you. That's all the words I have. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Woo! I was... Uh, yeah, I was definitely, I was definitely like, well, she could be watching, so I, I better try and do it justice and not say anything out of school. I didn't want to like try and put too many words in her mouth, so I'm glad she's on board with what we're saying here. And, <laughs> and hi, Charlotte, and at home, I hope you're doing well. <laughs> so in um, kind of partnership with this piece, Sasan asks, what advice do you have for artists who start creating a body of work outside their comfort zone, and how can they get over that mental block? Hmm. I I think I think the real the real key when you're gonna start doing something new is to remember how long it took you to create the first thing that you felt comfortable about or comfortable with, and and remember the feeling of that early on, what it's like to learn to do something new, and you are now going to embark on that again. And that's the scary part, right? It's that starting at square one feeling where now I've got to be uncomfortable again. Now I've got to suck at this again. And you can you do what you can to find um, areas of safety, areas like little life rafts within this new thing. You know, like how Charlotte is taking the world map motif and building upon it and moving forward. When you're gonna try and start something new or start a new series, it doesn't mean you have to abandon everything that you've learned and everything that you've done ahead of time or, or in the past. You don't have to give it all up and start from scratch. You can bring some of those things with you and it doesn't have to happen all at once. It's not like jumping off of a cliff. Some people might prefer that, that kind of cold turkey approach, but I think if you find yourself struggling or if you find yourself paralyzed, like you're not creating, what's most important is to keep making things, keep even if they're bad, like even if you don't like how they're, they're doing, you're gonna learn something every step along the way, right? Like every L is a lesson. You're, you're, going to, you're going to move forward as long as you keep creating. So if you bring a little bit of the old with you because it's kind of like a training wheel, I don't think that that's necessarily a failure. So that, that can be a way, I think, in which artists can, can find, you know, find themselves more comfortable in trying something new. Should we go to the next piece? That let's was our go. third one. Okay. Next. Oh, let's go over to Jenny. Looks like I picked six pieces. I think I was going to we can do a quick little spin room for any of you guys at home and in TV land who haven't seen the show. We might as well take like a pretty wide and meandering path to the next piece because now we're in the big room and this is really where the show starts to get going. Not that the work in the other rooms isn't just as strong, but when you hit the big space, I think anybody who's ever seen the show here in Foothills knows that like, we do what we can to really hit you when you come into the room with the high ceilings and the tall walls and really open it up. It's cold in here today. It's a little chilly. We can, uh, we can stop at Dave's. This is another one I wanted to talk about. So Dave is another perennial uh, participant in the member show. He's typically one of only two or three wood artists who we see regularly, but he's, he's like a real fixture at Foothills and just, just a fantastic member and volunteer um, as, a, as a wood turner. And he talks about using this specific piece of, I believe it's maple. His son is at home screaming because I don't know what wood this is. <laughs> he just says burl. He doesn't say, whoa, maple. Nope, I got it. Maple burl. This is like a big knot of wood with all of these interesting imperfections and textures. And this is why it's so highly prized amongst wood turners because this texture, this texture and pattern that you get is just, it, it's really, really, really valuable and really interesting when you can create something finished out of this. And what Dave talks about in his artist statement as, as, a, as a choice, an interesting choice that he made while he was creating this was another choice to not do something. And that's in dealing with this imperfection here, and it's actually, if you look carefully, there's a hole that glows clear through the other side of the platter. And Dave says that typically he would be interested, oh, cancerous growths on trees, mm -hmm. not knots, there you go. 
This is David Hawley, Catherine. And what he talked about in his statement was he would typically take some sort of um, natural turquoise, he says non-stabilized turquoise, to um, sink in and fill in to this fault and fill in this hole, which can in itself create its own interesting pattern. But he ended up deciding to leave the piece natural and not have any, you know, turquoise would be a really bright, saturated color. So that would be a, a bold decision to make. And he decided to leave it in and of itself and just kind of appreciate the fault for what it is. I resisted, he says, I resisted the impulse to inlay based on my recognition that such a naturally beautiful piece needed to show its splendor without further adornment. So in, in that decision, he dis, he's, he's showing us, he's making a statement about the natural beauty of the piece and that his influence upon it as a sculptor, as a turner, need not be more than it is. He needed to create the platter, and that's kind of it. And it didn't need more than that. And I think, I think part of the, the whole thing that we're talking about with the taking responsibility for your own decisions, putting it here, calling yourself out and getting it right on Front Street in your artist statement and showing everybody, like, this is a decision I made and I, I hope you agree with me, is, is, a, is a really incredible way of, of just taking responsibility for your decisions. Keep it, don't trip Anna. Don't trip her. Don't you. Hi. Hi there, you doing good. It's okay. Yeah, you did a good job. Um, yeah, so I, I think that, that take, like I said, taking responsibility for that is, is really, really brave, and that's something that we just want to keep highlighting and referring to again in, in this show. So follow me, and don't trip on Kiba. Come on, buddy. <clears throat> Go over to Jay's piece over here. Her collage work. She uses a lot of found materials. And the thing I wanted to focus on this piece is, and, and what Jenny talks about in her artist statement, is the decision to not have a face on her female figure here. And this is something that she's gone back and forth with and she highlights in her artist statement that I always make a joke when artists wipe faces out of their work that it's probably because I can't paint faces or create faces, but Jenny insists that that is not a fact and that she made this deliberately. She made the decision to omit the face deliberately, and I think that it's an interesting choice, and I think it has implications and it has ramifications on the work itself. So why, why do it? What are the benefits? And what, what you know, you obviously miss certain opportunities when you decide to omit a face from a work. You have to be a little bit more, um, you, you end up being a little bit more careful, a little bit less obvious, about what it is you're trying to express. So Jenny uses the animals and the symbolism behind the woodpecker and the fox for what kind of themes and what um, the specific characteristics of these animals, both like mythologically and generally speaking, what do we think of when we think of these animals? Those become the focal point of the work and the focal point of the theme of the work, rather than putting an expression on this woman that's happy or sad or excited or pensive you know we 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 don't get that so we have to look elsewhere and you end up getting work that's a little bit more subtle i think is one of the main things that ends up occurring when you, when you make the decision to omit a face or omit an expression from the work i think you also get to appreciate the rest of it a little bit more because as human beings, we're always looking for faces in everything that we see. It's, it's why it's so easy to make a face out of everything. It's why cars look the way they do with headlights and grills. We see faces and smiles and expressions in inanimate objects all the time. So when you remove that, you give your eye a little, you give the viewer's eye a little bit more freedom to wander around the piece and look around and see, you know, the, <clears throat> the other components her hair, the texture, the other elements of her form and her posture, we let, because we as humans are looking for as much information as we can get, since there is no face, it's like looking at a person with a blank mask on, we're trying to 
get as much information about her and about this scene as we can because we're lacking clues otherwise. And giving the viewer of the art the opportunity to do that can allow the rest of your work to really be able to stretch its legs and really get some interesting attention. So I think that, that that's probably like one of the best things you could say about not having the face included is that it gives the artist, it gives the viewer rather, the opportunity to really, really spend some time with other parts of the work. Krista is asking if you can read the artist's statement. Read the artist's statement in its entirety? Sure. Uh, the hardest decisions focused around the message I want to communicate. I've been working hard this last year or two to bring more meaning into my work. I selected these animals for their literary meanings. The woodpecker is considered to be a trailblazer, intuitive and inventive. Am I bouncing off of the wall or can you hear me okay? Because I could just pull this off and speak towards the camera. Anyway. <clears throat> uh, intuitive and inventive. While the fox is known as a clever and resourceful creature, often, a th often thought of as a wise guy, I chose these animals because their characteristics are ones I truly admire in people. Once I had found a way to express the meanings through the animals and through our obvious connection to nature, the next difficult decision was whether or not to paint faces on the people. I can paint faces, but I feel that, it is more um, that this is more effective. I have been showing these collage paintings around Colorado for the past year, and I love the conversations they spark. I find that the lack of faces draws people in to ask why. By asking my own questions in return, I have learned that many people don't miss the faces at all and find it easier to talk about things, things more important than physical beauty. I like to ask, what characteristics do you admire about yourself? It's a great way to start a conversation and to remind yourselves to focus on the important things. This year will bring more work of this sort as I'm striving to create a series of portraits of inner beauty. So Jimmy's trying to, <coughs> trying to give you the opportunity to see more about this person than just their face, which is where your eyes go naturally. All right, well, we can go to the last one that I have picked out. How's everybody doing out there? Do we know how many people are watching? We have 47 people watching right now. 47 people, my goodness! 48. 48 <laughs> people, I'm so nervous. I'm glad we're the last one. Oh, geez. That's so wonderful. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Goodness gracious. That's like a lot more people than the Santa had for his AMA. <laughs> I think. I think that's like a lot more. So, here we are at, at what is now our front runner and maybe our prohibitive winner since we're closed. I don't know how many more votes we're gonna get for the old uh, Viewer's Choice Award, but maybe we should set up something online. Uh, maybe we should pick like the top 10 and get them on a Facebook uh, uh, poll or something so that we can really have it out in the end here. But Ashley Hope Carlisle's piece, uh, it's called Set Settlement Assured, and it is this paper cast work of the seed pods, and if you look really carefully, some of them have these little laser cut doors and windows embedded in the seed pod. And she actually drove here from Wyoming to install this for me. I believe it was her husband and her, um, and they hung this from our light rigging. And talk about choices. Every time they install this work, they have to deal with a specific set of circumstances. How are we going to hang these pieces? What are we going to do about the light? What's the, the interesting kind of line and falling pattern we're going to create as these individual pieces tie into the main, the main focus on the wall? Um, there's, there's like innumerable decisions, just, just infinite. How high will this go? Where will it exist in space? Like, oh, do you Man, the light rigging is there, but will I instead try and hang it from the ceiling because I need it to be three inches further away from the wall? So there's all these really interesting decisions that have to be made, and that's just for the installation of the work. It, it's already created. So what Ashley focuses on when she's talking about her work was the decision to use some really, really high quality materials to get these these beautiful reds and these really, really saturated hues. She talks about using a very specific sort of Japanese paper. Uh, I just want to get the information correct. Let's see. 
All that, yeah, has to do with the scale, our highest quality, from the metal to the wood to the paper. She uses a handmade Japanese paper for casting. She talks about a beautiful residue left on the plaster molds after creating the work. <clears throat> and I imagine that, yeah, whatever solvents and glues you use to keep this together, that that would definitely bleed, cause the, the color of the paper to probably bleed a little bit. And you can see there's some variation in the colors in the paper that lends to the idea that this is handmade, that's not 100% consistent. And I think that that ties nicely into trying to make this look like it's something that really does exist in nature where the colors aren't 100% homogenous. This is a great example of looking at the little door that she has there. I don't know if that one is laser cut like some of the others. It's hard to tell if that one is wood like the others are. But there's some really, really inter intricate and interesting work. And like so many pieces in the member show, this is one where the photograph that we juried it in from was, sh we were like, oh yeah, that's interesting. An, an installation piece. We don't like get a lot of that. The, the, the photo that we had from the jurying was uh, a wall with two walls, kind of like our big movable walls, coming out from it perpendicular in this kind of like 290 degree setup in this alcove. And this piece was, was back in the alcove and then the, the petals were all kind of flowing in and it, it, was, it looked interesting and I was like, ah, I guess we'll see in real life what it looks like, but I, I think it, it's worth getting for sure. So we, we accept it and then she comes and sets it up and I just, like, like I was saying, a lot of pieces of the membership looks so much better in real life as I, you know, digitally stream this out through a cell phone, and a lot of you guys are probably watching on small screens, it just, it looks so, so much better in real life than it looked injuring. And, you know, we talk about all the time how important it is to take really good photos of your work if you're trying to get into shows, and you're trying to get jury in like we, we do for these, these digital, <clears throat> on these digital platforms, and just so, so often I'm seeing things in real life that look 10 times better than they looked in the show, and it makes, me, it makes me wonder how many things we're turning down that would actually look really, really great in real life and that we would probably want to include, um, you know, where so many of these things are getting in, we're like, oh yeah, it looks, looks pretty great, and then it just becomes my, it becomes some of my favorite stuff in the show out of nowhere when I, when I had only seen the photo of it, so it's just something interesting, and this piece was definitely one of those for sure. There's something special about, about an installation piece and having to make improvisations on the fly, you know, and sometimes, a lot of times when you're doing an installation, you're working with a partner, you know, or a team of people that are going to help you and you, they're all just trying to represent the artist's vision faithfully and that, in a, that's, you know, that's what I'm doing every time I hang a piece of work, but it's, with an installation, there's all these moving pieces and components and creative things you have to problem solve about that that sometimes involve making compromises and other times you're just trying to guess at what what the artist might have liked if you don't have really really detailed notes we're not always fortunate enough to have them there in, in life so in this instance to have the artist do it and their partner do it which was was really really great i think we we got an excellent example of an installation for this piece i really really like how it comes over the top of this wall which i'm not sure I'm actually almost positive that this wall was not there when they installed it, and I just got really into the idea of having this symmetrical setup of these walls in the room, and then I thought to myself, like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna obscure it, and it all just worked out really well, and it actually kind of feels like you can see the wind carrying these pieces as it pops up and over this wall. Uh, this is something really special about that that I really like. I, so, any, anybody out there have any questions? Anybody want to go look at specific pieces before we, we end our tour? No, just comments? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's see. Those were all the pieces that I had specifically picked out to talk about. Going on 40 minutes, actually, 36 minutes. That's pretty good. Well, I hope you guys are all doing well, and I thank you so much for joining us today uh, at the Art Center. Again, 
if I didn't introduce myself already, I probably skipped it. Um, I'm Eric Hockley, I'm the curator here, and I just I really appreciate all you guys coming to hang out and hope everybody's doing well and, and not going too stir crazy at home. So, bye, have a great afternoon.